Welcome to another episode of Inspire People Impact Lives. I'm your host, Josh Kosnick, Managing Partner, Northwestern Mutual. And today I'm so excited that we have Laura Holloway with us, special guest. She is a leading expert in health and wellness, which is a great topic as we come through uh, this COVID period where we're sitting on Zoom all day, uh, not probably eating the healthiest because we don't have as many options and whatnot. But uh, really excited to have Laura here today. Welcome to the show. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. You bet. So I, I was going to read your whole bio and I'm like, you know what? Let's just have Laura tell it herself. Uh, so tell the audience a little bit about yourself, your background, where you came from and how you came into today. Yeah, well, I actually got introduced to you through my good friend Thomas that I think has been on your podcast, Thomas Williams, who's you're just talking about such an inspirational guy who I met out in LA because I played volleyball. I'm from Illinois, I played volleyball at Penn State for two years and then UCLA for two years. And I stayed out there for 10 years and then got into the health and wellness industry. I always called myself certified unemployable. I went to one job interview, I'm like, that is just not for me. I'm not meant to be in a box. So started with a bunch of ex-athletes. We had this concept of building a lifestyle, healthy active lifestyle brand around, you know, what we were already doing, you know, eating well, working out, traveling, um, just living a healthy, active lifestyle. And so we started with one health, with one small nutrition club in Culver City. We would do workouts on Santa Monica Beach. We grew them to 400 people. We'd come back to our little nutrition cafe, teach about health and wellness, get a bunch of people fit. We grew to eight mega wellness centers in LA. And then now we're all over the US with many health and wellness cafes and then some larger wellness centers. And so I'm back here now in Chicago where I started my podcast and doing a lot more public speaking stuff and got to meet people like Thomas and yourself and co-founded a nonprofit along the way. So <laughs> grateful to be here. Well, it's just busy, busy. <laughs> What's the podcast called? So everyone can, let's give a shout out to that right away. Okay. The podcast is called Activate. You can find it on Apple. Yeah. It's all about living in alignment, both the soul line and the goal line. Oh, should we dive into <laughs> that right now? We can dive right into that. If you I, want. Like, I like that. Let me add the soul line and the goal line. Let's talk. Yeah. So, I mean, I always say so many of us are unconsciously working on the goal line, grinding, 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 and until we feel a sense of unfulfillment or we can feel a sense of like, okay, I made all the money and now what? Or, you know, there's just something missing. And so what I've really learned in my own journey is that if we're not growing spiritually and we're not growing on the soul line and we're not doing the personal growth work in conjunction with growing our businesses and our lives. Um, I don't necessarily feel like we're of heart happiness. And I think that's the goal is living in alignment. And that's when we really find f- true fulfillment. No, I, I love that. And I agree. And what was going through my head as you were saying mm-hmm. that is how have you connected your work through COVID when that's probably the most difficult time people have had? Most, I would say a lot of people, I don't know if most would be the appropriate term to say a lot of people like you and I were talking before we got on uh, recording in Chicago, New York, LA, places that have been really locked down, yeah, you feel hampered and maybe they're grinding behind these cameras that you and I are behind today and they haven't been able to, maybe their purpose is to be outside, maybe their purpose is to be in larger groups, maybe their purpose is to be you know, helping um, less fortunate people and they haven't been able to do that in a line. How have you found to help those people in this tough period over the last year? Yeah, I know it's a great question and it's been really challenging. I mean, the first thing that came forward for me right when COVID hit was like, I just got this spiritual hit is like, you need to connect as many people as possible. You need to figure out how to connect people. So, you know, I immediately started a women's group virtually where we still met now a year and a half later, every Tuesday night, where we bring women together and it's just leaders, you know, in the, in all different industries where we can come together and just support one each other one another and lean into each other you know spiritually business wise just ask questions have a space to be vulnerable and i think every person on the line can create that you know whether it's with a small group of guy friends small group of girlfriends local business leaders like people do need connection and we can do that virtually now um in terms of bridging the gap that's always been a big big passion of mine and i feel like the gap has even gotten bigger and so we've had to figure out how to work with local leaders you know, and get resources 
to people like however we can. I mean, maybe we can't do it physically, but we can still support financially. We can still get on Zoom calls. We can still pick up the phone and dial, you know, and support people like, hey, if I have an extra hundred computers at my company that we're getting rid of, you know, we had a bunch of kids on the south side of Chicago that could use these, you know, that you know, can't do school virtually right now. So all of us have, you know, connections and access and, and ways you just have to have the willingness to really step up and connect in new innovative ways. Oh, it's awesome. It's one of those things over uh, COVID that's been the most difficult is as human beings, one of our core beings is that connection, that human yeah. interaction. Oh my God, it's been so challenging. It's been so challenging. I had a niece born this year. I've seen her maybe five times, you know. You know, we've had to figure out the new Facebook virtual FaceTime thing. It's so weird, you know. It's like, it, it's a different world. And um, it's and loneliness is, and isolation is super, super painful. You know, I think that's probably the biggest sickness that we've all experienced through this, you know, time. It's just that isolation. And so, you know, I've been fortunate. I have local centers, so I've been able to show up for my community and just seeing people every single day has probably saved me as much as it saved them. Yeah. Um, but I know not everybody has that opportunity, but we do get to create that in new ways. If we're creating virtual online circles, if we're creating book clubs, if we're creating virtual workouts, there's a way to stay connected, pick up the phone, make sure you're going outside on a walk with your neighbor six feet apart, just, being doing the extra little things, you know? Yeah. And thinking outside the box, I think is what you're really talking about. Totally. Right How have you stayed connected during this time with your well, business leaders in the community? Yeah. Well, so interestingly enough, so the podcast has helped uh, keeping the office right. open once we could, um, you know, keeping our physical distances, you know, masks when we're together, um, but behind closed door, like I have right now behind me, mm -hmm. you know, I'm good here, but, uh, you know, what was interesting was last year, I've never taken so many walks mm. with Same. my family, right? Or Same. just seeing, you know, across the sidewalk in the neighborhood, some neighbors and being able to, you know, talk from across the street and right. Uh, right. Uh, just stuff like that. You, like you never saw so much of that. And even totally. before, like we live on a golf course and it's like before the golf course was open, which by the way, golf was a great release last year as far as like being around I bet. You know, people being able to do something physical be outside uh but before it was open just walking the the trails or in the in the golf course and just seeing different scenery stuff of that nature uh and being with other people right. as much as you could but it, it was difficult but i think that getting creative uh we had taken a golf cart ride with the kids that became their favorite thing so cool like, they're like, can we do, go do a golf cart ride? Like, how about we do a walk first before we do lazy again? <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah. I feel like golf carts are the new thing. I see them in my, like, the neighborhood I grew up in, and there's all these golf carts driving around now. I'm like, what is happening with these kids in these golf carts? We, we could probably do some research on did golf cart sales go up. Right? I think they really went up this year. Well, we know golf rounds went up because that was one of the few things that we were allowed to do. So I know at the club that I belong to, like golf rounds were up like 60% over the summer. Yeah. And I'm sort of sure that was the same across, you know, the country uh, if we if we looked at the data. So, totally. um, so hopefully you know, TikTok went up. I, I started TikToking with my 11 year old neighbor. <laughs> yeah, we had, we, had a, we had one that went viral. Oh, Did my you? gosh. That's fun. <laughs> Uh, but we had to outlaw that in our household. Uh, too many, too many, or not enough restrictions, too many uh, creepy. I have three daughters, so uh, that was I TikTok was outlawed. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't, uh, there's not enough sensory. Like you can't, like they can- It got out of them. control. You can show them an innocent video and then all of a sudden not so innocent. I know, I know. So, it anyhow. kept people way too busy this year. <laughs> but yeah, I did. And though I would say the one thing else that I noticed there is that uh, I just heard this morning, actually, divorce rates skyrocketed mm. over the last year. Yeah, um, so that's sense. an unfortunate uh, piece of the isolation, I think. Mm -hmm. But very unfortunate. Anyhow, uh, we'll get off a less, uh, I guess, put a, off a somber topic on this <laughs> better. But uh, where did this journey for, you talked about volleyball, but I'm sure it started probably before that. But where did the journey for health and wellness really begin for you? Yeah, I think I started playing sports when I was little. The first thing I think I played was 
soccer where everyone wins. Um, and then <laughs> <laughs> like when you're in what kindergarten, well, they don't keep score. Cause I, yeah. I, I one of those teams. Do they score. still do that? Oh, yeah. They still do that. <laughs> no, we don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. So, uh, but it was funny because some of the kids, right. Even before the parents, like the kids on my team kept score. They knew it. <laughs> so the kids really still want to win. That's yeah. hilarious. It's so true. I never got that, but, um, I definitely played all the sports until eighth grade. And then freshman year, I just chose volleyball. So, yeah, I would say that's where it started. Um, super, you know, like you lived in an outdoor area, golfed, played tennis, swam. So just sports and being healthy and active was always part of my life. And I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And so if I could live my lifestyle and make money doing it, that always seemed really attractive to me after sports. <laughs> Yeah. Were there any entrepreneurs in your family as well that kind of led you to not wanting to do the normal corporate route? I think it was something that was like bread around the dinner table. We would always have conversations like, you know, what if we built this company and how can we fill a need here? And it was just something my Shark Tank was always my favorite show growing up. I actually like binge watched like 20 episodes the other night. I still love it so much. And my brother has definitely done, um, he's scaled a few startups. He's been Scotty Pippen for a few big companies. So that's been cool. <laughs> um, and I think it's, we've definitely had an entrepreneurial spirit and parents that have really encouraged us to go after our dreams for sure. Good. So that's, that's cool. Like, I don't know that many families talk around about that around the dinner table. Yeah, you know, I do, the older I get, the luckier I know that I am, for sure. I was born to great parents, which I know is a super, super huge blessing. Probably one of the greatest blessings of my life. And um, more than, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit, just having parents that believe in you and love you is just, yeah. you know, huge. But yeah, I grew up in a in an area where I got to see a lot of people do like cool things, like a guy that invented the arrow bed, a guy that invented the milk top, you know, the pop milk top. And you can just see like, wow, that was such a small idea, but it was genius and he made millions. Like, <laughs> yeah. there's so many ideas like that. <laughs> and you're just filling a need or it's just something that's really cool and unique. Exactly. Exactly. So you played for two prestigious universities. Mm -hmm. uh, what were some of your biggest lessons that you took away either from coaching or playing or uh, professors or any leaders there that influenced your life? Yeah. Um, you know, college sports were, were really fun. I was, I got injured a lot, which was kind of led me to stop playing and, and not go the professional sports route and really go into the workforce pretty early. But I would say I did play for the two most winning coaches of all time in volleyball. And they taught me a lot, you know, Russ Rose, the coach of Penn State, he taught me that um, hard work is everything. I probably worked the hardest I've ever worked in those two years. Um, and I thought I was a hard worker before I got there until I got there. And I'm like, no, this is what hard work is. And, you know, he was probably the number one scouting report coach I've ever experienced. So just the level of excellent and attention, excellence and attention to detail he put in before games to so scouting reports, I think really gave our team an advantage. So he really taught me that preparation matters and it really can give you an edge. I think Andy Banikowski from UCLA, um, showed me that kindness really matters as, as a leader. You know, he's someone that his tenderness and his kindness, like I'll never forget that. Like, I think he made me love the sport when I left it. Like just, just how nice of a human being he was. Wow. I mean, those are two awesome lessons from two so different people. It sounds like, I don't know. So them. different. Oh my God. So I, different, but also both so winning. Yeah. And that's why it takes all kinds. And you like you as a leader, you bring your culture, your core values, and you recruit and attract those that exhibit and want to exhibit those values as well. And that brings Absolutely. you uh, brings the best out of you. Absolutely. And that's that's really that's really cool. So how do you apply those now today? Yeah, I mean, I definitely I have a compassionate. Um, approach to leadership for sure. I feel like people don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. So I really get into people's worlds. Like I think that understanding that people are people, you know, they're not robots um, and, and they have lives, they have families, they have emotions, like just understanding that they're, they're 
um, human beings and I, and I want to know what they want, you know, individually, not every person wants the same things. And when you can really understand what motivates someone and what people really want for themselves, then you can motivate them to work hard for themselves, not for me, but for their lives and their futures and their families and their desires. So I definitely bring a compassionate leadership approach. I would say I'm a visionary and I think that I don't know if I was taught that or it's just one of my innate gifts, but that's something that I definitely bring to leadership is casting a big vision and, and showing people something maybe bigger than they can see for themselves. And then, uh, you know, systems and strategies have always been important and, and all my coaches have taught me that. So I, I definitely don't go to bat without a, a playbook. <laughs> hey, you talked about uh, the Penn State coach and the preparation that uh, that really went in there is there something there that you stole uh, from that journey? <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I would say, yeah, I definitely, I am a, a leader that every single month I'll sit down with people and I will write out their playbook for sure. I'll write out, I'll map out the year, I'll map out the quarter, I'll map out the month um, for themselves, for their teams, for you know, their long-term goals. So yeah, I can definitely see where he played a big role in that for sure. Did you do a scouting report on me before we hopped on <laughs> I did not, I did <laughs> not. I'm glad I didn't because I'm really enjoying getting to know you for the first time. <laughs> no, was Sometimes funny. scouting reports aren't the greatest, you know, it's good to meet someone for the first time and yes. have your own experience of them. <laughs> do you do a scouting report when you go on dates? <laughs> definitely, I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably smart nowadays. Anyway. I, I definitely do it. Or at least you, I'm not on like any of the apps or anything like that, but I'll definitely call a friend. You vouch for this person. Okay. Maybe see cap them or something. Yes, for sure. So uh, kind of changing gears, but uh, you know, you've been really known to have that can do mindset. And I'm thinking about, uh, do you think that can do mindset? Chad and I had a conversation about it earlier today. Uh, about just because I feel like we're in the acquiring talent business as business owners. Okay. And it, it so like people so often think about positions mm -hmm. and I think like people in college also think about titles or positions. When I used to speak to universities, I said, uh, how many people think of a title or thought of a title when they chose their major? And almost everyone would raise their hand. Or when you're growing up, I wanted to be, you know, a firefighter or an NFL player or a doctor or whatever it might be. And so few people think about what those job duties actually are right. and would they actually find enjoyment, fulfillment, um, or would they even be good at them based on their skill sets? And so I'm like, think about the uh, requirements or what you'd actually be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And would you enjoy that or what would you be best at? Then match a title to that. But the can-do mindset is really important because if you give someone a task or if you uh, don't explain it correctly, which often happens in this business world because we're also fast-paced. Totally. We love that. Well, what do we call it earlier today, Chad? Figure it outness. So it's figure it outness, like someone that just can figure it out regardless of how much detail was laid out for them. Mm -hmm. So. Very you, rare, by the way. Really. <laughs> I think so. Someone that can just figure it out. I, I, I feel like I, I don't know. I wish there were more people that could just figure it out. <laughs> well, I think that part of it is being able to seek to find the right answer regardless. Yeah. So not just like making it up, but like, okay, I'm going to, because we are such in a resource rich world, Absolutely. whether it's Google or in our, in our, uh, you know, office, we have the corporate office over in Milwaukee. So like there's people to ask, but you got to have the like kind of fortitude to be like, okay, I'm going to figure this out through asking other people uh, versus going back to the person that instructed me to do it and, you know, possibly frustrating them or wasting their time or whatever it might be. Totally. So do you think the can do mindset can be taught or do you think it's something that most people are born with? I think it can be taught. I think you got to, you, you got to be around the right environment that breeds it for sure. I don't think everybody naturally has it. I think some people naturally have it. Um, I wish more people did. I think if you're around an environment that provokes it for you to be a self-starter and for you to take quick action, I think people can become great. 
I do think people can become great. And it's just small wins done over time that become habits. And I think, you know, certain environments, just like sports, you throw some somebody into an arena, they're going to learn something. They're going to get better, you know, if you, if you throw them in, you know. And I think you can throw people in a great environment with great leadership and absolutely people can learn to do small things well and it can become a compound effect and can be a life, can become a lifestyle. So if someone is listening today that doesn't feel that they have what I just described or, or want to learn to be able to figure things out better, what's like what tangible piece of advice we could give them? Yeah, I think the first thing you need to know is that you can do it. You have to, you have to believe in yourself. Like you can do it. You're not doing anything wrong. There's no right or wrong. Just just be curious like the answers out there right there's so many resources like you said there's the internet there's a friend there's a neighbor there's there's so many people to ask there's so many people that want to help um you just have to put yourself in uncomfortable situations you just have to be willing to get dirty you know yeah. you have to be willing to sweat like sweat equity is like lost these days i feel like because people can just get things so easily mm -hmm. and um yeah, like I, I think get after it, get dirty, fail, figure it out, learn yourself, like do do the extra research. I wish more people took more initiative and mm -hmm. then, you know, came back and asked for forgiveness, you know, if they messed it up. Don't you, don't you like, to, is that got to be one of your like least favorite characteristics? Like somebody coming back to you, well, what do I do next? Or how do I do this? It's like, figure it out. You figured it out. Yep. So, so thankfully I have layers of people underneath me that get those questions now. Uh, but yes, oh, yeah. it is one of my least favorite <laughs> things because yes, I want self starters ever. Just so everyone knows every boss wants self starters. Every boss wants a self starter. Absolutely. Absolutely. We don't expect you to know everything, especially right away. We want you to have that go get it attitude, that curious. Oh, I love the word curious. It's one of my favorite things. I think too many people are less curious or trying to be more impressive and less curious. Right. They think they have to get it right or they think they have to know already. So then they don't ask the questions and it's like, nobody knows. Right. We don't know. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you're not going to get it wrong. Or we got it wrong before and now can get it. Now we exactly. get it right because we failed before, but exactly. we were willing to fail. We were willing to fail, exactly. So what do you believe about curiosity? I believe that curiosity is one of the most important characteristics that all of us can continue to carry with us because we're never going to know everything. We don't know what we don't know, and then we don't know what we don't know, and then we don't know what we don't know, right? And so if we remain curious, every single person we meet can give us some piece of knowledge, some piece of advice, whether they're 11, whether they're five, everybody's coming to us with a gift if we can see it that way. And yep. then we can become sponges for life and we can experience life in, um, I think just like a more bright eyed, fun way. It's just a great way to, um, a great lens to view life. Can you imagine walking around knowing everything or feeling like you have to know? <laughs> uh, I did. <clears throat> In my early 20s, I think I was more that way. Yeah, I think I probably was when I was, the story was running me as an athlete. Like I had to prove my worth. I I, I had to win no matter what, you know, and, and letting that go is a huge chapter as well. Um, but I think living curious, I don't know about for yourself, but for me, it just allows me to live with so much more freedom. Yeah. Uh, I uh, Kids teach us so much and I love getting questions from like, <clears throat> my three-year-old or five-year-old that are just so innocent and pure and right. like seeing things through the lens of a child like brings you back to it's like seeing things for the first time again so like we were just on vacation like we uh, I told you before we started recording and like them their fascination at the aquarium or the zoo or you know like for us as an adult we go to a zoo we're like oh we've seen a lion before it's like lion before and my three-year-old just like in awe and it was a beautiful lion, by the way, at this uh, Phoenix Zoo or Tempe Zoo. Um, beautiful male lion, beautiful mane, huge paws, just everything majestic about a lion that you would see in the wild. Mm -hmm. And I just watched my three-year-old look at this thing. Like, because it was his first time right. really seeing a lion up close. Right. Right. And, uh, 
And it just, if you take a moment and sit back, like I did, and I'm like, like you kind of said, it's like, imagine seeing something for the first time every time you see something. Right. And the awe and curiosity that you would live life with. Right. Instead of being like, I already seen that before. Right. There would be so much like wisdom and excitement and vibrancy and just life to life. Yeah. Life to love. That would be fun. Yeah. And then if we get so busy, we don't necessarily think about it. So I'm just like reflective in this moment too, like I was last week, is like, I got to slow down to do that more. Mm. We all do. I feel like that, at least for a lot of us, I think that's what 2020 was. You know, we got over the, oh my gosh, you got to reinvent myself. And oh my gosh, you know, all these things, the world's ending. And then it was, okay, I have a lot more time like to go on golf rides with my kids and to go on long walks and to look my neighbors in the eyes and to make a good dinner and to call my grandma more. Yeah. <laughs> you know? The little yeah. things. If you have a grandma to call. Yes. Yeah. Because I lost my grandma, my last living grandpa last year during COVID. And I wasn't able to go in to say goodbye. I had to say goodbye Sorry. through a window. Right. Oh so God. that's... Um, and I bring my kids there, but he was able to recognize me and it was extremely sad. But at the same point, like at least I got to do that. I know a lot of people suffered last year in losing people where they didn't get to say goodbye right. or they didn't able, they weren't able to even go to a window. Um, so it is like, if you have those people to call and this like, there's reminders every day of this type of stuff. That's where the news starts off. If it bleeds, it leads. And they tell us this terrible story about someone that was shot or some tragedy, hopefully those are daily reminders, but oftentimes they're not because we become numb to it. Right. Let this be your wake up call. Call grandma, call your mom, yeah. call whoever you need to. Um, FaceTime, that's a great technology nowadays uh, to be able to see someone. Yeah. So what do you think about that? So you don't have kids yet, right? No, not yet. My kids and your future kids will never know a time where you couldn't see someone as you called them. It's really, really Like crazy. you and I picked up a corded phone and then a cordless phone. I know. But we didn't have someone's face on the line. Our kids will never know a time that they can't see someone as they call them. I know. Part of me is like, it's really creepy and it like really creeps me out. And then the other part is like, it's so cool. Like my one-year-old niece, like when I FaceTime, it goes to this portal. We have like the Facebook portal. She just turned one today. She goes over and she answers it. Like she knows what to do at one. She crawls and <laughs> presses the green button. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, she probably knows crazy. how to sleep. My kids that's, know how to sleep. No, that's crazy at one, at three. I mean, they're going to be building our future. So they're going to have to understand this technology. The it's other thing fast. I'll tell you about kids with uh, uh, devices that are very awakening um, my seven-year-old's best at this because she's a daddy's girl and, uh, and I'll get home and I might be answering a text to chat or whoever it might be. And she will pull my arm or she will hit me to get my attention. Good. And no, right. There's such as great reminders. Should, as she should, because I shouldn't have my phone, like head buried in my phone when I get home and I should be spending time with them. So I hope she never stops doing that. I know. Uh, I but know, that right? is a good, good reminder. They might actually end up being more annoyed at us with our addiction to it and be like so over it by the time they're our age. Like, I hope that's the case. Like that was that, that was what pulled me away from my parents. <laughs> yeah. No, I hope that's the case because last year, you know, with uh, homeschool learning and whatnot, they were on devices a lot oh as we were. So hopefully that uh, doesn't set them back further like some of the current research is saying. But anyhow. All right, let's transition. What do you think in your work has done or are, are the greatest benefits to working with being more in tune with your body, your spirit? What, what do you think are the greatest benefits that can come from that, from the work that you've done on yourself and the work that you've seen with the people that you've worked with? Yeah, I think when we do work, work on ourselves, we understand ourselves more. When we understand ourselves more, we can navigate in the world clearly. Right? I think so often we're making choices from a programmed place. You know, what was told to us growing up, what we should do, what, and, and we, we move through life with 
like a filled up backpack of things that we have to do. And we can do things from an unaligned, weighted down place. And so when we learn about ourselves, we can unpack our backpack, we can live lighter, we can live aligned, and we can start to understand what drives us, what's important to us, what our core values are. And then once we have those core values in place, we can make choices that are in alignment with our core values. And so we don't look back and regret a chapter of our lives. We don't look back and say, that was a really bad, poor choice. We can say, no, my, my core values are in this order. And this is what I say yes to. This is what I say no to. These are my boundaries. This is work that I'm aligned to. This is work that I'm not aligned to because there's a lot of ways to make money. There's a lot of ways to do business. There's a lot of opportunities out there. And I think we can get so caught with being a yes woman, a yes man, um, thinking we have to put ourselves in certain positions to get ahead. And it's just not true. So when we're in alignment with ourselves, we can live from a place of just truth, a place where where we know what's best for us, period. And um, I've seen that with my business partners and, and they're living lives, you know, the more work that they do, they're living lives that are fulfilled, they're balanced, they're, you know, for the most part, I don't know if there's ever like full balance, but, and they're giving back in ways that really, really are meaningful for them. Yeah, there's not full balance. I, I agree with you. There's there's integration. It's like work-life yeah. integration versus work-life balance. Or harmony. Balance, yeah, yeah, balance indicates 50-50, and that's what throws people off, and they'll never be 50 Totally. Yeah, at some points in your life, that's why I say core values are so important. At some points in your life, you know, for me, I can put work first, so then when I have a family, I can put family first. You know, it's like yeah. I got that money set aside where I'm like, okay, I have – five years to pop out some kids, you know, <laughs> like I did that. <laughs> and I'm glad I did that in that chapter. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. So uh, I, I think the core values thing you brought up is so good. How many people that you encounter when you first encounter them have their, core, like maybe a percentage or however it's easiest for you to answer this question, uh, have their core values figured out? You know, it's, it's surprising how many people say, wow, you know what, Laura, no one's ever asked me that or no boss have ever said what's important to me or, you know, what are my core values? Not many people spend time sitting down and thinking about those because where are you taught that? You're not taught that in school. You might be taught that on a podcast like this where you're like, take some time, reflect what's important to you. You know, what what really is important to me in this chapter of my life? How often do we spend time? Maybe at the new year and then we set it aside after the first month, you know, but really living in alignment with those values, I would say less than 20% of the people that I know do that. Because, uh, man, I, I think we could spend the rest of the show talking about this because it's so important mm -hmm. because it makes everything else so much easier. Like you easier. said, you can make decisions so quickly. Right. And you know what? That does not align with my values. I'm good saying no. Right. You don't have right. to even explain yourself. Right. I mean, you may want to sometimes to be respectful to whoever may have just approached you with something. But it was interesting, uh, as you got to know Chad a little bit as well, he's my director of marketing and uh, producer of the show. Well, so as he was coming in and we were deciding our philanthropy mission, yeah. we decided that we were going to do, we decided as an organization that 90% of, so our focus was going to be kids. Cool. And we decided that 90% is going to go towards childhood cancer research because it's so underfunded nationwide. And the other 10% would be room funds wise to go towards other kids efforts like the Boys and Girls Club or uh, we invest with the awesome. Madison Reading Project, which delivers awesome. uh, free books to kids, stuff of that nature. But there's so many great causes out there. And we get hit up as business owners all the time. Totally. To support these causes. Every day. Especially over the last 12 months because a lot of non-for-profits are really hurting. So quick plug, if you have extra cash, get something that you're passionate about, give them to those nonprofits. Um, but it makes really easy decisions for us. If anyone hits chat up, if anyone hits me up and says, hey, would you, you know, donate to this, like Alzheimer's or whatever it might be. Yeah. Sounds like an amazing cause. I've actually been impacted that with my grandparents. Uh, but here's our focus. Right. So I'm going to have to politely or respectfully say, right, no. you get kids underprivileged or whatever it is. And yeah. it's like, does it fall into this? Same, same with our nonprofit, you know, it's underprivileged, it's youth, it's education. Um, so it makes it easy. Does yeah. this align? Then you don't have to waffle over it. You don't have to like feel bad. And then it's not it. personal. It's like, yeah. listen, this isn't personal. This is just what I've decided is, is for me in this season. 
But if you don't have an answer, like, and right. And that's where people really get to spend the time doing the inner work. And it doesn't have to be this like whole process. It's just giving yourself space to know yourself. Yep. And so how did you come to know your, well, maybe uh, whether you want to answer that or not, is coming to know your core values, or do you have an exercise that you take people through to help them identify theirs? Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of exercises that you can do. I think, you know, you have different buckets, you have faith, you have family, you have, you know, health and wellness, you have business, you have finances, you have relationships, you have fun, you have adventure, you have travel, whatever you want your buckets to be, you know, you can come up with them and you can put them in a certain order. You can put them in percentages and you can rank yourself now. Like, where are you feeling full? Like, is this one at, you know, where am I feeling financially? Ooh, man, I could really use some work there. Right. I'm probably at like 30% there. Where am I at, you know, in relationships, man, my relationships are really lagging. So you can just like lay out all these areas of your life and kind of rate yourself. And then you can say, am I fulfilled? Am I happy? Okay. No, I'm actually not. I want better relationships or I really do want to be healthier. Like it is affecting my brain fog. It is affecting my mental clarity. It is affecting the way that I show up and how I feel my confidence and my skin. Okay. I really want to take my health seriously. And then you can kind of put them in order and then you can structure a plan. Okay. How am I going to execute on this on a daily basis? You know, okay. I'm going to make one to two phone calls to friends a day. I'm going to wake up and I'm going to give myself 10 minutes to work out, 15 minutes, 20 minutes to work out every single day or at least five days a week. You know, I'm going to clean. I'm going to drink a gallon of water a day. I'm going to get more sleep. You know, you got to put your priorities in place, but first you got to see where you're lacking. There you go. Let's go. Got my gallon of water right here. Chad's got one too. Oh, you guys on a gallon challenge together? Yeah, well, we started at the beginning of the year. It just, uh, that was the one thing I added. So like, I'm, I'm in, I work out pretty well. Yeah. Uh, and I always figured that I was uh, drink, taking enough water, but I never like calculated it. And sometimes you lose track based on, you know, you're drinking a 20 ounce glass. How many did I have? This, the, you know, getting the gallon thing, you just, it makes it simple. It's, it's super simple. That's awesome. Good for you. Most guys that are in an office like you are not drinking a gallon of water a day. They're pounding like four espressos. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like seriously though. I do, well, I do have coffee in the morning, but then I start my gallon water and- But that's yeah. awesome. That's a simple fix, honestly, because most people go for food and they're actually thirsty. Like little things like that. I know it's like so small to some people, but if you drink a gallon of water a day, it could really change your health. Yeah. Your skin, your mental clarity, yeah. energy. I mean, it's, it, I, I agree. It's, it's very good. Uh, one of the things I was going to talk about with uh, your, I did in 2012, I went to a Darren Hardy seminar who used to run Success Magazine, big cool. life coach. Yeah. He's out in San Diego, actually, in La Jolla area. Awesome. And um, his, his mentor was Jim Rohn. And so I don't know if he stole it from him or, or whatever it is, because Jim Rohn's like one of the OGs, like John yeah. Maxwell of leadership. And he talked about how you were talking about, um, he, but he put it in a wheel. So yeah, you could do it in a wheel. Yeah. Right, so totally. one to 10. And if your wheels out of alignment, okay, maybe that's the area, whether it's faith or relationships or health that you need mm -hmm. to focus on. So I thought that was a cool analogy maybe to draw out for people oh, yeah. uh, because that was really helpful for me to see is that, Hey, is your wheel lopsided? Mm -hmm. You know, have, have you let your health slip? And do we need to start working and make a goal towards working out three to five times per week or whatever that goal might be uh, to get that wheel back in alignment? Totally. And like you said, it's never going to be balanced. Like you're never going to have like a perfect percentage wheel. But like maybe this chapter of your life, you need to focus on a few things because you had your finance, you have your finances in order. OK, great. Now I really need to get my health in order. Yeah. So speaking of health, over 70 percent of COVID deaths were attributed to people that were obese and you're in a health and wellness business. Mm -hmm. And definitely have health and wellness centers in low income communities because in food deserts, there's a lack of education, there's a lack yeah. of access, there's a lack of so many resources where we're seeing a lot of these deaths happen. So, I mean, it's so, so, so important. I mean, this was, this was the wake up call for a lot of people. And for a lot of people, they're still out partying without masks and they don't care and that's fine and that's for them but for so many of us we've been shook to the core you know yeah. people we know or at least like one degree of separation of someone we've lost right um and yeah those are the ones like i have friends that have you know business partners and friends that have come out of retirement gone on the front lines to new york and they were putting people in body bags and they said they've never seen anything like it Laura. they're like it is the worst thing we've ever seen and it's people with preconceived health conditions absolutely and so we have to take our health seriously and so what's your biggest so i know beyond the um 
the underprivileged communities that don't have the access. I know you're doing a lot of work there. But for the uh, biz, busy business professional, for the yeah. busy mom, for all of those people, what are your what are your nuggets that you could give? I know there's so many, but if you could boil it down to a couple, I always want to try and give people some tangible stuff as we yeah. talk to experts. What are some tangible bullets we could give people, whether it's motivation or uh, cooking or wherever you want to take it, I guess. I don't want to structure you. Yeah, no, I just, I think we get to make health a priority in our lives. That's first, you know, and that takes like, conscious shift to say, okay, this is something I have to focus on. It's not something on the back burner. Like I get home and now what's for dinner? Because if you do that, you're going to grab snacks. You're going to grab something bad. You know, it, it's got to be something on the forefront that you're thinking about prior to the week starting, like prep Sundays, like what, how am I going to lay out my health this week? And that's going to look different for everyone. It's not a one size fits all, but if we're at least putting it on the front of our minds, I need to take my health seriously. Now we can, you know, shift the way that we, we structure our weeks. Um, so just having healthy things in the fridge uh, to grab, to snack, you know, you can pre-make meals, you can have, um, you know, fruits, vegetables, all the good things. We need to boost our immune systems, vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, echinacea, um, drink a ton of water, get a, get a lot of sleep and practice mindfulness, whether that's, you know, prayer, meditation, walking, getting in nature. Um, mental health is so important, um, so important right now. If you give one tip, I think a lot of people get intimidated by the thought of meditation. Yeah. I would say someone I told, I started uh, our conversation with telling you how ADD I am. <laughs> yeah. So I would tell you that as an ADD person, meditation, uh, I don't know if it scared me per se, maybe because I'm hesitant to say that, maybe it did scare me. Uh, but where I find I, I started doing Wim Hof breathing exercises. Cool. And so for that 12 minutes or so, that I'm doing that, like that's my form of meditation because I'm utterly focused on my breathing Yeah, good for you. and then those retentions. And so I'll do some prayer and some thought work in that time frame. But is there any tips that you have for people that are uh, either like, oh, meditations for hippies or meditation, <laughs> I'm scared of that. Or like, I don't know what thoughts are going through everyone's mind, but. I love that, that's so funny. <laughs> any thoughts or tips there for those people? Yeah, I just think people, um you know, put meditation in this box where it's like, I need to sit there, you know, with my thumbs to my pointer and I need to be like in a sit seated position and it needs to be so serious. And I just don't look at it like that. Like a meditation could be walking in nature. A meditation could be, you know, riding a bike and just being present in the moment. But like what you said, the biggest thing about meditation is just being in relationship with your breath. Um, because when you're in relationship with your breath, you're in the present moment. And so all medicine, all meditation is trying to do is to get us in this exact present moment, not in the past, not in the future, but here now. And so we can do that by listening to our breath, breathing. One simple thing that I do is you can like plug one nostril and you can breathe in for three seconds, plug in the nose, plug the other nostril, breathe out, breathe in this nostril, your left nostril, three seconds plug it, breathe out your right. You can do that eight times. And what it does is it just like brings your right and your left brain together. But that's the biggest thing is just find a way to get into the present moment. That's really cool. That's really cool. Box breathing, anything like that. Yeah. Download the Wim Hof app or whatever it might be. I love that you do Wim Hof. That's awesome. Do you, you do the cold pool too? Uh, so I will, um, I will do that. I've also done the polar plunge for special Olympics, stuff of that nature. Cool. Um, there's a great resort up in Wisconsin Dells or, or spa resort that they have a, a meta or, um, so it's like a routine before you go into the spa to get to your body ready and you go from hot tub to cold tub and you're yeah. supposed to do that a few times. I actually want to get a cold tub in my house. I, I find from my football days, I, I can jump into an ice tub easier than I can turn a hot co shower cold. Oh yeah, for sure. It's so painful to do it yourself slowly in the shower. <laughs> I, I agree with that. I totally agree with so that. So I actually want to get a cold tub uh, as, my, as my thought process there, but- uh, It really works. It really works. I've done it a few times. It's painful, yeah. but it works. And part of it is for a lot of people, yes, there's skin benefits. Yes, there's blood flow benefits. And you can probably speak to all that different stuff. But one of the biggest benefits that comes to it is conquering your own mind. 100%. It's doing something really, really tough, something that, you know, 
per, like sucks, like frankly, mm -hmm. it sucks yeah. to be really cold and put your body into a state of fight or flight and be able to conquer your mind in that moment and conquer your breath. Yeah, know how to get back to center. My One of my mentors always says, I want to do something every year that pushes pushes the boundary of what I think is hard, right? So a lot of the guys that I work with, they do lead builds, like one of the mountain biking races in Colorado that's like super, super tough. And they'll always just say that used to be hard and it's not, and just keep pushing out what's hard. And I love that you said that. We got to expand our capacities to learn how to bring ourselves back to presence in difficult conditions. <laughs> It was interesting. In negative today, temperatures. The negative temperatures. So tough mutter is one of those as well. They put your body in different right. types of, and, and it's not, and they say it at the beginning of each, you know, race, this isn't a race. We're not timing you. This is a challenge. Mm -hmm. Right. So and it's putting your body through that challenge. Yeah. Um, so awesome. So let's go through, I want to be respectful of your time. Okay. Uh, any systems or, process or processes for growth, reflection, productivity, leadership, anything like that before we get into the word game? I mean, I think the biggest thing, and you and I have talked about it a lot, is giving yourself personally and then with your team, your leadership team, or whoever you're around, your family structure, because um, families are teams, right? Giving yourself time and space to reflect. You know, what are my core values? What's important to me? What is my three-year timeline? What are my three-year goals? My one-year goal? Now, how can I work backwards? Let's create 90-day plans. Okay, if I'm creating a 90-day plan, what do I need to execute on each month? And then back that up even more. What do I need to put into place each week? And then it's a daily plan, you know, down to waking up, making your bed, having a glass of water, doing your mindfulness practice, getting in the gym, and having that daily routine where you can start to build the muscle of trusting yourself when you can start to trust yourself the way you show up in your life is different and so it's just having mm -hmm. those small habits every single day where you can start to lean on yourself more your confidence grows and um, the way you're going to execute your goals and your dreams are going to shift do you do that per, i'm asking you personally i know other you can do it many different ways but do you do it through meditation journaling but yeah, do I do all that? of it. I have a lot of different practices, um, but I try to do something every single day. So I do something called freeform writing where I'll just spend five minutes. I'll just get everything out. Like I'll mind up. I'll just get everything out of my mind. Just write, 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 write. Then I'll be able to get in a state of like actually journaling. Um, and then I'll put that into time, to, time blocking, like actually what I'm going to do that day. What's most important that I get done so I get that out of my head in the beginning of the day um but some practice every single day of mindfulness for sure for sure prayer for sure gratitude and I try to express my gratitude to someone every single day handwritten note text how do you go about text, it text usually um yeah a meaningful text typically yeah that's cool that is cool and it's a great uh tip for anyone uh some handwritten people, notes next level and i do do that but th i like that i want to do yeah. that more when you said that i'm like i need to do that more well you know what's awesome about it and i need to do it as more more as well and i and i uh, do it sometimes and i and i again need to do it more but what's awesome is like most people nowadays are used to only getting a card a handwritten card from their grandma totally if their grandma's still living right yeah or like a baby yeah. shower thank you you know right. like what thing you expect so whereas we're getting texts and messages all the time, like that's some, someone took time to write on a card, which is rarely done anymore. That's really powerful. Yeah. The other thing in reflective learning I thought about was John Maxwell says there is no learning without reflective or without reflection. Mm -hmm. And it can really uh, expedite the learning should you take the time to actually reflect. I agree with that. We're just going on automatic. And so, so much of all this like systems and processes is just giving yourself the space, right? Yeah. So interesting today, and we're just to wrap things up is we were talking about breathing as well. Just this morning, my one of my coaches was taking me through uh, some, uh, he asked me what I did wrong in a situation. And I was going through that and it was with a toxic person, I was like, this person triggered me too much. Mm. And I, and I don't, I'm really in control of my emotions. Mm -hmm. And with this person, they were allowed, I allowed them to get to me too much. And he's like, okay, put yourself in that situation. And to make a long story short, like he made me for 30 seconds, imagine a situation where I was triggered by that person. 
and I felt my chest tense up and my breathing constrict. Mm -hmm. And he goes, okay, stop. And he goes, now take a deep breath, ground your feet, wiggle your toes, feel each toes, feel each toe. Take, breathe in through your nose, feel the temperature as it goes in through your nose. Feel the temperature as it goes out of your nose. Feel the slight difference. And he ground like your body just starts to let it go. Right. And he goes, so next time you're in a situation like that, remember to breathe. Remember to feel your toes. Remember to be present. Because I have this, and I don't know, I'm sure there's others like me, but uh, where anger is a default emotion when I'm triggered, yeah. Whereas for some people, uh, it may be uh, sadness or frustration where they cry or like, I, I can actually feel it bubble from my stomach through my chest and then I word vomit something mean. Right, right. And so I, I can feel it. it physically. Mm -hmm. I need to stop it through breathing. I mean, that's so beautifully said. I'm so grateful men like you are practicing this in the workplace. <laughs> I mean, no, that's so powerful that you're, you're consciously bringing this into your work. Cause that's just a domino effect now, yeah. you know? And if you teach other people in your office to breathe, like that's huge. Now we're really responding and we're having genuine conversation. We're not reacting. Cause then we're just fire on fire. You know, well, it becomes anything. a vicious cycle. Absolutely. That's what you're saying is like our brains have these mirroring neurons. Yep. And when that person triggers you, you trigger them and you go like this and it just cycles and becomes not a healthy conversation or outcome. Absolutely. And what you're realizing is, is it was really something in you. It was, it was nothing, it wasn't even about them. They triggered something in you that you actually have to heal and work on. Yeah. And when, and when you can do that and realize that now real healing begins and like space opens up for, for like transformation and work in the workplace. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. And it, again, it's being present enough to realize it yeah. and, and do it. Next, yeah, wonder. It's so much easier to project. You know, yeah. he's the asshole. You're fired. You know, that was actually a growth opportunity for you to transform something inside of you that needs to be healed. Yeah, and it's someone on your team, so you want to develop them and and give them the tools to be their best. Totally. So you got to be your best. Totally. We're so good. powerful. All right, word game. You ready? Yeah. Let's do it. All right. So for the audience that may not have uh, listened to an episode before and tuned in for the first time, the word game we play is I'm going to say a word. <laughs> And Laura's going to give me her initial, uh, just subconscious response, the initial word, or maybe a short phrase. And the only rule we have is she cannot repeat herself. Okay. So first word, Laura, action. Powerful. Love. Deep. Fitness. Fun. Life. Playful. Death. <sighs> Happiness. Energy. Life. Failure. Hard. Success. Fun. Did I say that twice? I can't remember now. <laughs> okay, I don't know if I can. <laughs> so, since I don't remember, you didn't say it twice. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, inspire. People. Impact. Lives. Boom, you just named the podcast too. Oh yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> do people do that a lot? No, actually I think you're the first one. Oh cool. <laughs> That's fun. All right. Good job. Yay. All right. So favorite book of all time or most recent or book most recently read that you want to give a shout out? Ooh. Favorite book of all time that, you know, I really refer back to a lot is A Course in Miracles. Um a book that is like a digestible version of that is A Return to Love by Marianne Williamson. Nice. Um, yeah. So I know the famous Marianne Williamson quote, but I've actually never read either of those books. Oh, I think you would really enjoy them, especially with what you just shared right there. Yeah, that's cool. Before. Yeah, it's all about um, living, you know, realizing relationships, being the catalyst to love and healing. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, the favorite podcast that you listen to, not your own? <laughs> Mine is definitely not my favorite. <laughs> um, can I have a few? Oh, my sure. gosh. I listen to a lot of podcasts. For entrepreneurship, I like how I built this. For um, 
like growth and spirituality. I love Brene Brown's podcast. I love uh-huh. Marcus's podcast. And then um, I listen to a lot of uh, John Maxwell. Yeah, he's all, I mean, the OG leader. Yeah, so solid. And his voice is so soothing. Right. So, yeah. Have you done, you said you've done some of his workshops? Uh, I have. I did a leadership summit with him and uh, yeah, he's and read almost every one of his books. He's so good. Great. So good. There's some stuff that's repetitive, but it's like repetition's the mother of learning. So it it just resonates over and over. Yeah, and like he always brings it back to like the most simple, basic things, and and leadership is basic at its core. <laughs> leadership is influence. Yes, it is. Right? Yeah. All right. So, how can the audience follow you? Get in touch with you. Uh, what's the best methods for that? Whether it's social yeah. or otherwise. You guys can follow me at lauraeholloway.com. Um, at Laura E. Holloway on Instagram, um, the nonprofit that we're launching, but I wanted them to, to be involved with yours, but ours is one for many.org. Um, but follow me on social and we'll have workshops and retreats and fun things on there. You guys can get involved. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for pouring in to the our audience today. It's been a pleasure to have you. It's been a great, probably one of the more ADD conversations I've had. <laughs> we've covered so many awesome things that it, that it worked and I know it's going to be great and impactful. So I'm excited for everyone to hear and uh, just to get your influence and your leadership. So really happy you took the time with us today and that Thomas was able to introduce us. Thank you. I appreciate you. All right, everybody, as we uh, go on with your week, as you go, I should say, as you go on with your week, make sure you're doing as much inspiring and impacting people as possible. Take care.